May we move on to uh, the paper <coughs> gender items three, uh, where we do deal with one of the um, major areas of research is around recruitment strategy and, and associated risk and contingency. Jo. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. Um, yes, you, you're quite right to point out this has been one of the areas that we've uh, flagged as a, a, a red risk in the past in the uh, assurance framework, and uh, therefore we've been discussing it at, at every board meeting. Um, I apologise, I'm going to say quite a lot today because there's quite a lot in the paper and it feels like we've got to quite a critical point in the recruitment programme. So, um, but the headline of what I'm going to say, I think, is that I feel we are making considerable progress and we've made very good progress since the last meeting. Um, whilst achievement is still challenging because of the scale and complexity of what we're doing, and we mustn't forget that the commissioning board is the biggest of the, the new bodies in the new system, I am cautiously optimistic that we are going to hit the targets on the recruitment strategy now. So just by way of background to remind people, um, the recruitment strategy has two objectives, really. One is that we must populate our structure of what's turning out to be around 4,000 jobs before we take on our full set of responsibilities, which is next to April. Um, so that is six and a half months away. So we have six and a half months to fill our structure. Um, the second objective is one that we've talked about a lot at this meeting, and, and obviously we talk with partners about quite a lot, which is a system-wide agreement that we have with other receiving bodies and sending organisations. The commitment is that the 48,000 staff who are affected by the reforms in the, the NHS and the Department of Health will know if they've got jobs in the new organisations by the end of December. So that's three and a half months away. And the, uh, the reason I point the two objectives out is they are slightly different. So, that, so in terms of delivery, we are not saying we fill all our jobs by the end of December. We are saying we, um, all staff in the existing system will know whether they've got a job in our organisation by the end of December. By the end of March is our deadline for filling jobs. What, this, what the December target means in practical terms, just trying to break it down in terms of what that means we need to do, um, we need to have completed our organisational structure down to every level of job. We need to have um, shared it with sending organisations, given it to them, um, had conversations with them about whether there are any jobs in our structure which are currently being done by someone in the existing system. And we call that job matching. So is there a match to one of our jobs to a, a match in the existing system? And for where, where that happens, staff will transfer in. Um, and where there is not a match to the job, we then run a recruitment process that is limited in competition terms to people that are at risk in the existing system. So that's what we need to do by the end of December. And in some areas, we've already done that. And I'll, I'll go into more, to more detail about that at the moment. Um, but in terms of progress since the last meeting, um, I'm very pleased to say the structure is now fully complete. So we now know exactly how many jobs we've got. We've got 3,963. Uh, which is slightly more than our estimate, our, our very first estimate of three and a half thousand, so that's good news. Um, we've shared the structure with sending organisations, um, and for eight of our nine directorates, we have broad agreement with senders about where we've got matches and where we're going to advertise jobs. So they're progressing. Um, we're also making very good progress to recruitment to what we call very senior manager posts, VSM posts. They're our most uh, senior management jobs. Uh, almost all posts are now live, by which I mean uh, there's either a matching conversation going on or there's a recruitment process in train for those jobs. And the majority of them will be filled by the end of September. Um, five out of nine directorates have already hit the December target for VSM jobs. Um, and two directorates have achieved it at 80%. So in, we've nearly hit the December target for the SM posts, and I'm pretty confident we'll be much closer to it by the end of September. And the reason we started with VSM recruitment is really vital because it unlocks the recruitment process for the rest of the organisation. When we look at our structure, the average span of control is three people. So the average manager has got three people who recruit them, which means that every manager's got three people to recruit. That's an average. The maximum spans nine, but that's unusual. And there are five layers in the, the core structure of the um, organisation. There are slightly more in the operations directorate. So that gives you an idea about how recruiting a VSM can kind of very quickly 
uh, accelerate recruitment to the rest of the structure. We've now also started recruiting Agenda for Change staff. So where we've recruited a VSM, we've straight away allowed them to, to get on and recruit their people. Um, and so as of yesterday, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry I haven't got these, I'm not allowed to table figures in a public meeting apparently, but we will put them on our website later on today. Um, and I didn't want to put them in the paper because the paper was written three weeks ago and the, the numbers are changing all the time. So as of yesterday, we had appointed 103 people. We had a further 345 posts at the advert stage um, and interview stage and 155 job matching conversations were going on. So in total, that's 603 posts, about 15% of the, the total number of posts. Um, in terms of process progress that we've made since the last meeting, I think you'll recall we talked about the fact that uh, the processes were rather slow and we need to speed things up a bit. I'm pleased to say that we agreed with the, the trade union colleagues that we could reduce the number of uh, stages that we would go through for VSM recruitment, and that is helping enormously. We're having a similar conversation with them about Agenda for Change recruitment, but we haven't uh, finished those conversations yet. We've also managed to bring in significantly more HR capacity through a, a, a partnership agreement we've got with NHS employers and Capsticks, and we've mostly deployed that out in the regions, which is where we feel we're going to need it because it's where most of the jobs are. Um, we've also got a recruitment plan now for every directorate and every region, and these show that all parts of the organisation believe that they can hit the December target. Although for some of them it'll be more challenging than others, and Ian will probably want to say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, the other issue is quite a specific one, but we've talked about it previously, so I think it's worth just giving an update on it, which is about uh, family health services staff, F FHS staff. We've previously agreed we're going to lift and shift those staff into the board. Um, and I'm, uh, I can report that we've um, been going through a process of trying to identify exactly who those staff are in sending organisations, which involved the commissioning board drawing up a specification, um, a description, if you like, of what, what was in scope, what we mean by family health services functions, and senders have been identifying which staff work in those functions. Um, the commissioning board will then transfer those staff in and we will rationalise the ser those services over sort of 12 to 18 months from 13-14. Um, we've had initial returns from senders and it looks like there are about 2,500 staff um, who currently work in FHS services. They're on top of the, the nearly 4,000 staff in the core structure. Um, but I give you that... Uh, figure with caution because they're, they're the first cut returns. We're just checking that they're all complete and doing some validation on them. So, um, but that number, that two and a half thousand number is in the order of the magnitude we were expecting. So that's good. Um, so good progress, making me more optimistic, I think, than I was last month. Um, and my analysis of the risk, I think, suggests that we will certainly be okay in the National Support Centre. Um, the area of most risk is in the regional and local area team structures, which I think Ian will say something about in a while. But um, the reason for that is the design of that bit of the structure took longer. It was immensely complicated. <laughs> Without going into lots of detail, there were lots and lots of issues in there that needed to be uh, worked through. So it's understandably taken longer. And it's also where the majority of the posts are. So it's where the scale and complexity is so so that's the bit I think which is the, still the remaining risk however having said that uh, all four regional directors are um, telling us at the moment that uh, they feel they can hit the targets um, we've shared the structure the ops directorate structure with sending organizations and they're coming back to us with initial views this week on whether they feel bits of it are matches bits of it are recruitment um, however you know, we've always said this is this is potentially high risk, and it would be. Uh, it, it's really important that we do think about contingency in case we we don't hit it. Having said all the things I've said about being more optimistic, um, and um, we we do need a, a plan B if plan A doesn't uh, quite work. So um, we need to think about what if by the end of December we haven't concluded all the com job matching conversations with senders or we haven't made all our posts available to staff at risk. And the paper that you have in front of you talks about variations of something called lifting and shifting, which basically is moving staff from sending organisations and dropping them into the board. 
Now, clearly, um, that is not a particularly palatable option for either the staff themselves or the commissioning board. Um, for the commissioning board, it, it, it means extra, crop, extra cost and extra workload around rationalisation later on. But I think, really importantly for the staff, it prolongs the period of uncertainty. Um, and um, the important point to note is lift and shift isn't a permanent solution. It doesn't create more permanent jobs. There's still only going to be nearly 4,000 jobs. Um, so, have, so for those reasons, if we do have to activate lift and shift, I think my advice would be it should be as targeted as possible. And having talked to Ian about this, I think our view is that certain bits of the organisation will easily meet the December target. It would be nonsensical to have a massive list, lift and shift into the organisation. Lifting and shifting people into parts of the organisation where all the jobs are filled is, is ridiculous. So um, I think this should be as targeted as possible. If we, if we need to use it, and I hope we don't, and it should probably be geographically specific, um, and uh, I hope that um, I hope that kind of I've explained that in a way that makes sense because I think it's um, it's kind of um, it's one of these things that I think people are talking quite a lot about at the moment, and there's a there's a lot of commentary about it, and I think we just need to be very clear about what we mean by it. And uh, the other thing I would say is. It is too early at the moment to trigger those contingencies. Absolutely too early. Um, we still we still feel that December target is achievable. Pace is picking up. Um, clearly, lift and shift itself is not without workload or downsides. Um, so if we need to do it, I think we'll um, you know we will need to make a decision about it later, probably towards the end of October, beginning of November, recognising that if we do do it, there will be a workload associated <coughs> with it, and if we're going to do it by the end of December and identify the staff involved by the end of December, we'll need a bit of time to do that. Um, so that's the December contingency thinking. In terms of the March target, I think contingency is slightly more straightforward. So if by the end of March we still have vacant posts in our structure, I think the executive team will have to assess this on a, a directorate by directorate basis almost. So I was thinking as an example, if at the end of March we have a 2% vacancy rate, which is about 80 jobs, 80 jobs spread across the whole organisation is different to 80 jobs um, in particular functions, um, and therefore the, the contingency arrangements we might make might be different. But broadly, we, we're not thinking about lift and shift for those kinds of things, because by that point we will have been through staff at risk in the existing system. So contingency actions for March will be things like bringing in interim support, asking staff we've already appointed to take on more responsibility or to cover a bigger geographical area in, in Ian's case. Um, we might, if we've had particular problems recruiting into a particular bit of the structure, we might want to have another a look at the structure at that point. But I feel that that's something the executive team should assess in the new year. Um, finally, I just want to turn to the issue of diversity. Um, the paper includes some information about uh, the workforce that we have currently recruited. The, the data you have in the paper is based on the first 50 appointments that the commissioning board has made. It doesn't include any information about staff that have been matched to us, by the way, or have transferred in, because we don't have any equal opportunities data on those at the moment. We've just got um, data on the people who applied for, for jobs with us. Um, this is a really significant issue, I think. Um, and I should preface this by saying, I think what we're trying to do here is quite unusual in my experience of 20 odd years of working in the NHS, which is we're trying to be very transparent, almost in real time, about our recruitment process. So we're not waiting until we've filled our 4,000 jobs and then saying that's what our diversity profile looks like. We're trying to do it almost in real time. And we've done that purposefully because we believe diversity is important, we um, are committed to transparency. And I think we believe there is a strong business case that says if you have a diverse workforce, you have a better chance of improving outcomes across the range of services for patients. Um, so the data doesn't make for easy reading, I think. Um, it's fair to say. While some areas, some small areas, we're doing OK, disability, we seem to be doing well on employing people over the age of 60. Um, there are some big issues around gender and ethnicity and some other factors. Um, so 
this is always a very challenging issue in my experience in the NHS. And I, so we have taken some actions um, already. I'm not sure they're enough. I think we, we need to do more. We have been training our recruiting managers. Um, I've made personal contact with BME candidates on leadership programmes. We've been looking for executive search solutions that reach into underrepresented groups. Um, publishing The decision to publish the data itself, in a sense, shines a light on the issue and therefore changes behaviour, I think. so. But clearly much more needs to be done, uh, both in the short term um, and this data relates to 50 jobs, and we've got 4,000 jobs to recruit to, so there is time to, to do stuff. And in the medium term, in terms of the pipeline into senior jobs, because these 50 jobs represent the first 50 appointments we made, which by their nature are the most senior posts. So um, I, I guess people will have views on that, and uh, I think we probably need to take some more actions out of the meeting, Chairman. But Thank you very much, Joe. I think um, members of the board will have views on the diversity issue, but before I open that up, um, I think we might come back to you, Anne, if we may, for some more about um, recruitment in your area. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, and I guess my um, sense on this is that um, we have made significant progress uh, since the last board meeting, but we've still got a long way to go. So I think if one looks at the progress, uh, the structure is now published, and that, um, as Joe said, is not an insignificant thing to have um, undertaken. This is a, a structure um, for uh, more than 3,000 uh, people's uh, future roles um, stretching across the whole of the country, uh, as well as in the National Support Centre. So the amount of work that was necessary to get that into a place that uh, commanded support and uh, was ready for publication uh, was significant. It is a major um, a major uh, move forward, I think, for the whole system, um, as well as for staff, that that is now published and therefore takes us on to the next stage of the recruitment process. So that has been completed um, and has moved us from where we were at the last meeting. But parallel with that, um, the recruitment process um, for um, the leadership cadre um, of the commissioning board in the NHS, which is what the operations directorate is, has well advanced. Um, so the last time we met, um, I think it was from memory the case that effectively just the regional directors have been appointed. Um, since then, um, not only have we run the process of the first round of recruiting the local area team directors, um, we have also um, advanced very significantly in recruiting the directors at the regional teams and the local area teams to support those team directors. So the medical, nursing, um, operations, uh, direct commissioning, um, and uh, etc. those directors, um, that process is well underway. That's important, not so much because that's a huge group of people, because it isn't, but for the reasons that Joe said, these things tend to work sequentially, and therefore, the, uh, as more people get recruited, each of them undertakes recruitment, and the whole process then moves faster and faster. So we are seeing that strong acceleration now that um, has just commenced um, that, and that needs to continue. So I think there has been very significant progress, um, uh, but nonetheless there's a lot to do to meet the um, 31st of December objective that, that Joe rightly outlined. Um, we've got five recruitment streams below the VSM uh, level, um, which as Joe said is soon to be complete. Um, those five recruitment streams um, are the bulk of our staff. Um, there's one for the National Support Centre, um, which I think um, is relatively small in number because it's a small national support function and that should be relatively straightforward. And then the big ones are the four regionally led processes um, covering the regional teams and the local area teams across the country. Um, the message I think is, as Joe said, I've had further communications from the regional directors um, in the uh, very recent past, and the message is that each of the uh, four regional um, teams expect to complete that process by the 31st of December to meet the objective. That therefore is our plan A. Um, it is um, obviously the case that to achieve that a lot of things need to happen and people are working very hard on this both in senders as well as in, in the commissioning board as a receiver. So all the processes that we need to go through necessarily um, to, to work through job matching and, and the various other HR processes all need to work to timetable um, for that date to be met. So it would be wrong of me to say that there's 
an absolute guarantee in any sense at this stage that that can necessarily happen. It requires expeditious action on behalf of all the organisations to get through to that timescale. But that said, um, that is our objective. Um, it is, I am told, feasible, um, and I see no reason to doubt that. And therefore, I think, like Joe, my clear intent would be to carry on with Plan A, work through, uh, recruit the right people for the right jobs, bring them into the new organisation for which they'll be working, and then give them the best chance to start their new roles um, on that basis. I think it's right, absolutely right, that we have to have contingency plans. I very strongly support Joe's suggestion that um, in the hopefully um, in the hopeful, hopefully unnecessary case that we would need to have to have to deploy them, they should be as limited as possible. Um, and we will have to deal with that if and when we feel the time is right. But the time isn't right now. Certainly my sense, Chairman, um, is that we have to stick to Plan A. And um, at the moment, that certainly looks like it's feasible. And the Operations Director, I think, is united in working with senders to try and make that happen. Well, thank you both very much. I think there are two issues from this. The diversity one we'll, we'll turn to in a moment. I think the first <coughs> issue is the sheer intensity of the recruitment process. Yes and the desirability of recruiting individually the right people uh, into each post. Um, lift and shift is not a recruitment strategy, uh, and it doesn't um, deliver any of the qualities that we wish to bring into the organisation, as, as it were, a linear transfer. Uh, so whilst we understand that the essential need to have a contingency plan, I'm sure the Board's wish would be that we didn't have to call upon it, Agreed. and that we were able to use what you described as effectively a snowball effect uh, of, of recruitment to be able to be in a secure position by end December and, of course, by, by end March. Can I take some observations on the recruitment processes and the risks and the contingencies before we turn to the diversity issue? Moira. Um, to endorse um, what you said, Chair, and again what Joanne said about um, lift and shift being um, actually a, con a continuation of uncertainty, but I wanted to ask a, um, a question about the practicalities, because we're talking, of course, about people being appointed, but people taking up post is a different thing, and yes. what's, um, you know, we've got a whole set of organisations that are losing people that still have functions to carry on, and uh, where is the oversight, because a number of colleagues around this room have got two jobs, and uh, a foot in both camp, and that it, it, it's important, again, that um, we have a concern for that, um, that that process, but you know how many people are able to take up jobs, and uh, and will there be a big bang, as it were, finally when um, uh, we reach the, the, the inauguration date, as it were, or you know, how is that going to work? I haven't got any figures with me, more but I'll let you have some. But um, it's true to say we have quite a lot of people who are doing more than one job. I mean, broadly, people fall into three <coughs> categories. Someone who we appoint and they can start straight away, which is great. Somebody who we appoint and we don't actually need them to start straight away. So we can give them a delayed recruitment date and they can carry on doing their old job in the old system. And people who both the old system and the new system need. And they're the ones that, um, I guess, from a, a health and wellbeing point of view and, a, and all those sorts of things, you kind of have the most concerns about... Um, I think we, wherever possible, we try and keep those numbers as low as possible. So we're trying to kind of backfill at one end or the other. But in some cases, it's just it's just not possible, really. And as close as we get to um, March 13, April 13, I think the more um, we as a system will be kind of um, stepping in and starting to... I mean, it doesn't make sense to have a big bang handover at the end of March. And... I don't know, Ian, if you want to say something about the dual responsibilities of lap directors in that sense. So I think um, there's the two objectives, both of which are equally important in this. Um, the first, obviously, is to build our organisation and prepare for taking on our new functions, and that's really important, rightly, to members around this table. But at the same time, I think um, we also absolutely have to ensure that we do whatever we can to support the current organisations in their continued accountabilities for the oversight of health care um, until uh, midnight on the 31st of March. And so I think what Joe's referring to is um, uh, a, a process of transition that's going on out there, which I think has been a subject of extensive conversation nationally and which we'll see um, 
uh, people who are appointed to senior posts within the commissioning board um, at regional and area team level increasingly working to support um, the old, if you like, statutory organisations, SHAs and PCTs through that transition. Uh, as we get closer to the 1st of April, that I think makes ever more sense really because the reality is we have to have that that, that has safe handover of responsibilities. We can't afford for any of the batons to be dropped in the transition. I think it does mean <clears throat> that um, some individuals will continue to have to have more than one role, um, and, and that will need, I think, management. But I think the, the overall view is that it's the right thing to do to both secure today, but also from our organisation's perspective to ensure that our inheritance and, more importantly, the services that patients receive, which define it, are in good position at handover. We are picking up through the induction process with people who have got two jobs, um, some strategies for handling that. You know, as somebody who does it myself, I think, for example, one of the things that's really useful is to have defined periods of time where you are doing that job and defined periods of time where you're doing that job. If you try and mix up the two jobs on the same day or in the same, it, you, it is very difficult to get the mindset shift in place. So. Now, uh, um, two questions, Joan. Um, one is, of the senior posts that we've recruited for, how many of them have been from outside the NHS where we've actually made appointments? Because I, I didn't see that. And the second thing I wanted to ask about, you know, when, when you're bringing in a lot of people into an organisation, one of the key things is the induction process so can you talk a little bit about when people join mm -hmm. how are we socializing them to what the new responsibilities and goals are going forward i will um i'm sorry in answer to your first question i'm sorry i haven't got a figure with me i will get one and circulate it what i can tell you is it's a small number at the right. moment so if you look around this table for example the national directors the only person recruited from outside one. was tim yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it is it is quite a small number, but I'll circulate it. In terms of induction, um, what we are what we are planning in terms of induction, and what we're kind of road testing at the moment, is that every individual will have a one-to-one -one conversation with their line manager, and the line manager will use a, a, a set of materials that they've been trained to use and that are corporately consistent. Um, and they will take people through some of the issues like I just mentioned to Moira about if you've got two jobs, how are you going to handle that? So there are some personal issues in there, but there are also all the issues that we'll talk about later in the OD paper about the vision, values of the board. Um, uh, we are trying hard because we know that there is an evidence base that successful organisations have a strong sense of shared purpose amongst their employees. So what we're trying hard to do is, as employees come in, get them to build on that vision and values stuff. Um, for senior managers in particular, mostly recruited senior managers at the moment, um, we have pulled together a leadership forum, which meets for the first time next week, but then we'll meet monthly, every month after that. And I think that's an opportunity as well to reinforce this vision, values, mindsets, behaviours, this is a different organisation, how is it going to work type thing. But the plan at the moment is, rather than have a, a programme, a course, where we bring people into a room, we will use a combination of events that we already have in the diary, like the Leadership Forum, and one-to-one -one conversations with individuals. Um, that's partly because uh, we think that's a better way of doing it um, and partly because uh, the logistics around running induction programmes for 4,000 people at which there was some <laughs> senior presence from the organisation is just a bit too difficult in the time period we've got. Thank you. Um, um, John, thank you for completeness for the board. I think I ought to just uh, reassure that the process for recruiting to the commissioning support units which the board will host 
uh, and that cohort of staff who are out, out in the field is running to broadly the same timetable with the same assurances. The uh, 21 commissioning sport units, the vast majority have got managing directors in place and they're recruiting their other VSN posts. Um, I, so I think for, uh, for commission support units and the staff who are um, looking and expecting to go into those units, um, there, there are some advantages that um, has put some of their recruitment ahead or the process ahead because these small units where they've been working with clinical commissioning groups have had a very early idea of how they wanted uh, to deliver that frontline business. They've broadly been able to align staff into those uh, those uh, um, shapes and structures very quickly. Um, so I think most of them, most parts of the country, they've got a very good idea and, and a movement down the recruitment. I think there are some issues because almost everywhere in the country, um, the final certainty for those commissioning support units about their income on which they can base the final structures and the absolute numbers uh, is, uh, is still not complete. Um, but the, the recruitment does proceed in line with and at the same pace for the uh, staff in the NHS commissioning board uh, yes. mainstream. Thank you. Shall we then turn to... I was about I was to turn gonna, to... I was just going to ask a question mm -hmm. about the risk. Have we considered, or as part of our analysis of the risk, um, how we hang on to good people, I use that term, you know, lower down? Is, because it is a very yeah. anxiety-provoking period, yeah. and yeah. what tends to happen is that people think, you know what, yeah. I'll get a job, <laughs> um, and yeah. it might not be a job. Yeah. Um, Have you got any sense of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it clearly it is a, a risk. I mean, and, the, and this process has been going on for quite a long time now, hasn't it? So I'm sure in some areas good people have, have gone. Um, one of the things that I just want to go back to what, what Ian said about, um, you know, the kind of pace that you can move at once you start recruiting people. And from my point of view, what I'm pushing um, is as soon as somebody's recruited, they get on. You know, they get on and recruit. I also think we're looking at the moment at an option around um, where we can do um, generic recruitment to certain grades, which might mean that we don't go right down the organisation. We might say once we've got people who can recruit, we'll recruit a load of people generically at that band, good people, and then we'll assign them to jobs. Kieran, I did. Can I ask a question around um, programme budgets? Um, in the sense that, that it impacts the recruitment. If you, know, if you think of network, for example, uh, there'll be some people who'll be funded out of a core pot, then there'll be programmes which will fund some other people, and then CCGs at some point will say, we want to commission yeah. a programme here. And managing the recruitment of that through that process, when this recruitment process will only deliver a certain number of, of the jobs, but actually time will deliver the rest. How, how do we synchronise that so that both in a way linking to Victor's point that we retain the intellectual capital which does mm. exist in the sending organisations. I just thought just looking at my financial advisor. Is that how that works or is it...? it it's a mixture, but I think the, 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 <coughs> the most helpful answer is where we know about them now, they've been built into the structures we've designed. There are some examples of that in the operations directorate where, for example, the, the resources supporting the clinical networks in the regions and, and localities have been baked into that structure. So as we recruit to the structures for the operations directorate, they'll get recruited as well. You're right, there's a more fluid um, set of programmes that get set up and disestablished at any point in time, and I think that has to be a bit more ad hoc, uh, recruiting into those as the, as the programmes themselves get launched. Can I come on to the diversity? Uh, yes, if, 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 if we're... Okay, we've covered uh, the rest of the make diversity. Sure we have, have time for this. I mean, I, firstly, I applaud... Uh, publication of where, where we are, um, I think that's right. Um, but then there's quite a big but, uh, because we did set out with a very clear ambition to be um, an inclusive um, organisation, to represent the work we do and the um, <coughs> benefits of living in a rich and diverse society. Uh, and where we are, uh, quite frankly, if you follow that trajectory, uh, we're not going to meet those goals and, and the outcome won't be satisfactory. So, I mean, I do think that, that there's some really serious stuff that we need to, to do here. Uh, and, and firstly, I think we need to look at the short term and whether we are doing enough, um, whether we are um, 
having the right types of interview panels, um, whether we have really reviewed job descriptions um, at the risk of zoning people out uh, because of, of, of their experience, uh, whether our whole imaging and comms um, is, 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 is shutting people out, because we can't, even in this round, follow this trajectory uh, through. I think there's then some, some serious deliberation we need to make, Joe, about um, the medium term. Um, I think we're in a situation where um, I would like to see us d discuss targets uh, for an organisation which, um, which reflects the communities in which we, we, we live and work, um, and then set those targets for managers to achieve uh, over a cycle. I think it's been a successful way of doing things in, in, in the private sector not perfect, um, and I think we do really have to, to do that. I recognise your pipeline is not uh, where you want the pipeline to be, but we have to maximise what, in the short term what we have <laughs> in the pipeline and then make sure we grow and, 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 and build a pipeline uh, for the future. So um, it's, a, it, it's a sharp comment quite deliberately, I think, because um, this is one of our most important people aspects, I think, for the shape of this organisation. Um, Victor, was um, can I support Ed's point, but, but also make you know, congratulate you in a way because I, I think this is probably, you know, rather sadly, the first time we've had this kind of transparent approach to this issue. And usually, we find out um, only too late when the impact of not doing this properly is built into the organisation. Um, three things. First of all, this is partly a result of history. You know, this is this is not just about what we're doing with the development of the commissioning board, and we should remember that and not be defensive about it because I don't think that's particularly helpful. Um, secondly, I would I would support what Ed said in, in terms of an approach. The only problem, and there's research to, to, to back this up, is that there are, it's not just about, clearly it's not just about numbers, nor is it just about race, by the way, we know that. It's also about culture and brand. And this is where I get... Um, uh, with permission of the chair, I get concerned about the way in which we think about things in silos, because it seems to me this is directly connected to some of the issues that Tim's got to deal with in terms of how the organisation is, you know, it's presented, and I just wonder what help the board can give you as an executive, not just you, because it's not just your problem, that's the point, to, to look at that issue and keep it focused actually on patients and the mm. public because that's what it that's what it's about really um, and I mean to be honest I'd be so bold as to suggest that we might want to set up some kind of subcommittee that actually looks at this stuff in the round you know not just in terms of the mm. culture stuff but also in terms of the brand and how we keep this because otherwise it becomes it becomes a target issue it becomes anxiety provoking it becomes about race which mm. clearly is an issue but mm. that's not it's about how we provide services to the public fundamentally, yes. and, I, and, I, and I'm getting just a little anxious about where this might be heading. Okay. Sorry to sort of connect things, but I just before you come back, Joe, can I take any other observations? No, Joe, would you like to perhaps respond well, to those? I, d I can't disagree with any of that. It's mm. it's completely right, um, and uh, I. I think you get two different perspectives there, which are both really useful. You know, the cultural thing and the the, the, the importance of setting targets and being clear about this. Um, clearly, there are some very urgent things to do because, I, as I explained earlier, the recruitment stuff's really picking up now. We're moving at a very fast pace, so we need to take some very very immediate actions. Um, not. Um, as Ed says, uh, there are also some medium-term things we need to do. Um, so I, I think if Jim's okay with it, I would like to suggest that Jim and I take this away, because Jim is the executive lead on inequality, um, as a matter of urgency, to work out, I think we've got to get under the data, work out what the problem is, where it's happening, what is it, is it that people can't meet the person specifications because we've overlaid the amount of experience people have to have, you know, whatever. We need to get under the data, try and understand it and then make some very quick um, changes to the way we're working I think whether that's interview panels or how we draft person specs or whatever I, I would very much welcome um, involvement um, as Victor says from non-exec colleagues because um, I think people have got experience from other sectors that would really help us because I don't think we've ever been terribly good at this I think perhaps 
without going to the extent of setting up a committee, although Victor's point was, a, was a, of a committee that was far broader than simply diversity, but how we uh, build these values into everything that we do. Uh, you certainly have a very warm support, I think, from both Victor and Ed and from other non-executive directors as you take it through with you, Jim, and um, take it through the next stage. And then let's think as a board at a future meeting how we take the much bigger picture of the sort of organisation that we want to be. And I'm very taken with what both Ed and Victor were saying in terms of the community that we serve. Uh, we need to have a staffing that is um, a reflection of exactly that. So. Um, can I just commend Jo for having drawn this to our attention in the way that she did? And um, thank the board for the conversation that we've had. And I think you get a sense of our full support uh, for the action that you're proposing. Thank you very much.